If you have your Bibles, we're going to be going to Matthew, the 27th chapter this morning. Matthew 27. Now we'll find out just how much I repeated myself this morning till now, because as I went back and looked at my outlines, I see that I've already covered part of this. So will that will that cause it to be less, you know, will, will we get out sooner? No, probably not. Anyhow, Matthew 27, what we're going to be looking at is protecting the tomb. While we looked at this morning, the soldiers that guarded the tomb, we are actually going to be looking uh, most mostly at the protection of the tomb, how it was that they prepared themselves to make sure that n- no hanky-panky was going to be going on as far as the tomb was concerned. Okay, so uh, we'll get to that in just a second. Why don't we go to the Lord and word of prayer before we begin. Father God, we thank you again. We love you. We we cherish the time that we have to be with you and to be able to allow your word to move in, into our lives and affect us in the way in which you would have it to. Father, we know that, that you are uh, God above all and that there is none like you and that Jesus came into this world and he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin and that he rose from the grave that we might have a new life uh, in him and a, a, and a promised life with you in heaven forever. Father, we just ask that you would be with us this morning uh, for, for uh, our sake. Help us that we might be able to remove the things of this life uh, away from our minds and our hearts at this moment and help us that we might just simply just sit at your feet and, be, and, and listen to the things in which you have for us this morning. Father, if there be sin in our lives that, that needs to be dealt with, then reveal that to us this morning. And if there be one that needs to, know, needs to come to Jesus before it's everlasting too late, I pray that today might be the day that they accept Jesus and, uh, and, and, and know what it's like to have a Savior who is in heaven. And Father, to have the hope that lies within inside of them with the acknowledgement that, that all things are possible because of the love in which you have for each and every one of us. Father, may you be honored and glorified uh, through the remainder of this service. We just pray that, that your name be lifted up because we know that the scripture says that if Jesus be lifted up, all men be drawn unto you. Forgive us now where we fill you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew 27, we're going to begin our reading in verse 59, where it says, And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre, and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, let the disciples come, uh, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting the watch. First, we begin by just simply acknowledging the fact that. Jesus being crucified upon the cross and the the tomb that was not so far away from where he had been crucified in the garden in which it was actually laid, that Joseph had for himself prepared a a, a new tomb, a a tomb that the scriptures would tell us that nobody had ever used. It was, as was sung a little earlier ago, it was a borrowed tomb. And I love that thought in and of itself, the fact that it was borrowed, because it meant that, that Jesus wasn't going to be occupying that tomb forever. That, that in the totality of what he is actually saying there is that Jesus would, would rise from that tomb, so that tomb could be used later on down the line, right? His body would no longer be in there, and so it would be vacant. But I also think it's, it's important to see the tomb for what it really represents, and that is that it was a stone prison. There was something that was hewn out of the rock, a place in which they would uh, put the body and then roll a stone across it 
so that nobody could get in or get out. I mean, they would, they would go to do the things which needed to be done for the, for the body itself. But it wasn't one in which, you know, people would naturally go to for other purposes other than to put a dead body with inside of it. I know that we've all probably been through many uh, funerals over our lifetime and have seen, you know, as they carefully uh, pick up the casket and, and move it into its place, but we never really see because they don't want uh, to bother us with it is them lowering it down into the ground and covering it with dirt because that's what it is. It's, it's a place to bury a dead body, a body that no longer has life within it. In Isaiah, the 22nd chapter, in verse 16, the scripture says, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here that thou hast hewn thee out a sepulcher here? As he that heweth, out, heweth him out a sepulcher on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock. It's a, it's a rock. It's a place that, where they dug a hole so that they might be able to place with inside of it a body. And, and all of this is, is normal. It's not something that was different because it was Jesus, other than the fact that, that Joseph had given a, him, for, for a little while, a tomb that one day would be his, right? That when he passed away, he expected to be put into that tomb himself. That this was a very normal thing that was taking place. The only difference being that it was the body of our Savior that was placed within inside of that tomb. And then the stone was rolled across the front of it to, to seal it. But I'd like to tell you this morning that even though I, I might say that it's a stone prison, what I would also like to, to tell you this morning is that there is life in the grave. That because Jesus, even though his body was placed there, does not mean that there was no life. For life would come back to the body, and the body would be resurrected. That just because they put the body within inside of a grave does not mean that there was not life that continued on. Something uh, really somewhat interesting and, and, and far out to me is the scripture found in 2 Kings, the 13th chapter, in verse 20, where it says that Elijah died and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold, they spied a band of men and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and he stood up on his feet. Now I find that one very powerful. And I find it very illuminating in the fact that, that all that had to happen, that this man who had died, who had passed away, touched the bones of Elijah, and he came alive again. See, I don't believe for a moment that the grave is our final frontier. I do not believe that it is, it is where we, we end up. That we just get put into a, a grave till, till the worms are done with us. I believe there's life that still exists. Life especially for the child of God has put their faith in Christ. Life which will one day move back with inside of that body and that body shall live again. But it won't live in the same fashion in which it was. But it'll be a glorified body. See, that's what I, I believe this to be about today. And I believe that that man rose from the grave, you know, at that moment in time, he had life back with inside of him. And that was life at its full. By the way, I don't believe that a person who dies without Christ dies without life. It's just that life goes to a different place. And rather than being in happiness and in joy, in everlasting peace, that, that life is in torment. 
tormented like nobody has ever seen before. Because along with that torment is the inability to die. And out of the presence of God forever. So what we have is that we have in the tomb, in the grave, we have life that still exists. Life for you and I. I, I, I am of the persuasion that when we leave this world, when, when our final breath is breathed, that we continue to live on. We just step into a different place. That we don't, we don't really die as, as, as what we know death to be, but, but what we do is we move on to a place where God is preparing for us at this present moment in time. The grave in which Jesus was placed in was not a, a grave that, that would be able to contain him, but a, a grave in, in which the body would lay for a moment but eventually would revive again. This tomb, we are told, that Jesus was laid in was, was one in which had been prepared, if you would, for him to be, to be placed in. A grave that actually would fulfill some prophecy. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, in verse Nine, it says, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. The, the, the most outstanding thing about that is Jesus himself, as he came into this world, he didn't come in amongst the rich. He came in as one that was poor. He emptied himself out of the riches that he had to become like you and I. He became poor. And who was it that Jesus hung around during his lifetime? He hung around those that were poor. And so when it says he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, it goes right back to Joseph, a rich man. <clears throat> who had hewn out of a stone his own burial plot, but lent it to Jesus for a moment in time. So he made, even though he was poor, even though he hung around the poor, he made his grave amongst the rich. Another thing to, to show unto us the establishment of God and how God himself moves in directions to accomplish the things that only, only he can accomplish and to do the things that only he can do. The next day, the day of preparation, the day in which they had, would make everything ready for the Passover, the next day we would find that it was at that moment in time that all of a sudden the, the, the priest and the Pharisees were alarmed at the fact we got to do something to make sure that this tomb is secured. We've got to protect this tomb. Lest that by night his disciples come and his disciples take the body out of the tomb, deceiving the people. Matter of fact, this is one of the things in which was labeled upon Jesus by these, these very men, that Jesus was a deceiver. We find in John, the seventh chapter, verse 12, where it says, And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. See, they, they believed that this was all a hoax, that this, this was nothing more than, you know, flashing cards and, and you know, a sleight of hand. That Jesus was nothing more than a deceiver. Some said he was a good man, but others said he was a deceiver, that he deceived the people. And one of the, I think one of the most profound things that, that, that is said is the fact that they believed that if they didn't do something quick, that the disciples would come and, by night and they would take the body of Jesus out of the tomb, deceiving the people because they were a part of the scam. But what is said 
is that if we don't do something about this, the last error will be worse than the first. In other words, the fact that they could not they could not silence Jesus and his disciples during his lifetime, that the, the next thing that would take place is a greater error would happen, a greater deception would take place than what already has happened. They were besides themselves. Therefore, they needed to protect the tomb. They went to Pilate asked Pilate for the permission to be able to have some guards set there and also to seal the tomb. Well, Pilate said unto them, and, and, and notice the wording in which is used by Pilate. He says unto them, ye have your watch. Not necessarily, I will appoint men to this job. You know, that I will, I will, I will call these, these soldiers over here and I'll bring them. I'll bring, I'll bring the people to watch the, the, the tomb. But rather, he says, you already have it. There, there was not a shortage, as we talked about earlier. There was not a shortage of, of soldiers that were there at that moment in time. They were, they were in their towers. They were, they were watching the crucifixion. They were appointed to the tomb. They had their watch. There was nothing that they needed to worry about as far as of, of, of men who would be able to be there to guard this tomb. They were sufficient. And, and let, let me just add this one thing to it. God says, bring it on. Because he didn't care. I, I, will, I will bring more soldiers so that you understand that this is not a deception. This is not a hoax. This is real. You have your watch. It saddens me to think that men could be so cold and callous as to, as to move in such a direction that they have to make sure that, that, that this man, this one that they had put to death, remains in that tomb. Could you imagine that for a second? Could you imagine burying somebody and, and having to put somebody over that, that burial plot and, and make sure that nobody comes no, at, at no time to take him out? I mean, the process of it in, in, in itself would, would be a grueling thing. We already know if we, if we would just go back in mind and take a look at the disciples, we, we would see the men who were afraid who ran away. Yet these were the very men that they were worried were going to come and take the, the body of Jesus out of the tomb. <laughs> you have your watch. And so they would seal the stone. And, and nobody knows exactly what that, that means as far as how that process was done. It is said that Daniel, when he was, when he was buried or when he was put into a, a, a tomb, that they sealed it. But what they'd done is they'd tied bands around it to kind of keep it into place. And then they would put the insignia upon that. Well, so the closest that we could probably get to understanding of what it meant that they sealed the tomb, other, other than the fact that they were protecting it with these guards was that they would roll the tube in its place and would be fixed with inside this hole and that they would take wax or cement and they would put it into the, the crevices to keep it sealed. And then they would have Pilate put his insignia upon it saying that he ordered this. And so they would have it sealed. Now here's, here's exactly where, the, where they find themselves to be watching over the tomb. And they wanted this to be taken place for three days because they had remembered in their mind that the, that the deceiver, as they called him, but Jesus had uh, told them that in three days he would rise from the grave. So they, they were given, they wanted a time of three days to watch over this tomb, a time of three days to have guards, you know, placed in their positions. Three days they wanted that seal to stay in place. So, setting the watch, a large number of soldiers placed in a position to make sure that nothing could take, could happen 
unto the body of Jesus. We get so sometimes bent on a thing that nothing can move us in another direction. Maybe they were moved by their hate. Maybe they're moved because they were insecure with inside of themselves. Jesus had had this great multitude that had followed him wherever he had went. And they, so they saw their numbers dwindling and his rising. Maybe it was lucrative for them to be in the positions in which they were in. And so they did not want any, any more to, to, to harm you know, what they can make out of this. Maybe it is just because the devil moved upon them and, and moved them in a direction of doing something that even the devil himself could not stop. Either way, they had they'd requested their watch and they got it. They requested that it be sealed with, with a stone and they got it. They had set their watch and waited and believed that nothing could ever happen to that body that was placed within inside of that tomb. But one cannot simply be, you know, struck with the idea of how wise, how how marvelous God is, in that He set this thing to be the way that it was. So there would be there would be no saying, hey, the disciples came and got him by night. They would have to recognize somewhere down the line that they could not keep Jesus in the tomb. The circumstances of his burial, all of it led to, to this very point of watching over a grave by night. Believing that that he would that they would come and take him by force. This is God. Where things seem to be impossible, God always makes things a reality. And the reality is, is on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. Come and see, for he is risen. He's not here. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and verse 19, 19, as we come to a close, the scripture says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. When Jesus ascended into the heavens, he led those that were captive into captivity. And one of these days, we will go to be with him. For those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior, and in Jesus alone, let me tell you something, religion can't save you. I know a lot of people would like to think that it can. If I just if I just try to do the right things, I be in the right place, you know, everything right. But there, first of all, we could never do everything right. And it only takes one sin to separate us from God. So the fact of the matter is, you can never do everything right. And so it is not religion that saves you. It is not baptism that saves you. It is not how, how, how much of the Bible you read that saves you. There is only one thing that can save you, and that is through Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men whereby a man might be saved, and that is Jesus. Except Jesus today is your own personal Savior. He is not in that grave. He is risen. Historical fact, he is not in the grave. Trust in Jesus. Receive new life from him. And if you have that new life, if you've already put your trust in Jesus, live for Jesus. Rejoice today because your Lord, he is not in the grave. He is risen. Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer.
sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble? so faithful who will all our sorrows share Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord 